So our topic of today, at least to start with, is what are called homogeneous systems of equations. And a homogeneous system of linear equations is just a system where, come on, where all the numbers on the right are zero. And when I say on the right, I mean on the right of the equality symbol. So for example, something like 2x plus y plus z equals zero x minus y minus z equals zero, x plus y plus z equals zero. This is an example of a homogeneous system of linear equations. And it's these zeros on the right-hand side that make it homogeneous. We want to make a few observations about homogeneous systems of linear equations. That's a mouthful. Um, the first observation we're going to make is that all of these systems are consistent. If you remember what that means, a system is consistent if it has at least one solution. And this system here, for example, has the solution x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero. If you just let all of your variables be zero, then these equalities become the rather trivial statements. Zero equals zero, zero equals zero, and zero equals zero. And this wasn't a unique property of the particular homogeneous system I wrote on the board. Every homogeneous system has this property. Let me write that. Every homogeneous system has a solution. And that solution is gotten just by letting all of the variables be zero. And this solution has a name. It's called the trivial solution. So when we're working with homogeneous systems of linear equations, the question isn't, does this system have a solution? The answer to that is always going to be yes. It's rather, does the system have a non-trivial solution? And let's remind ourselves there are only three options here. A system can have no solution, 
one solution or infinitely many solutions? Well, no solutions is right out because the trivial solution is always there. So what we're asking when we're faced with a homogeneous system is whether it has one solution or infinitely many solutions. And because every homogeneous system has this trivial solution, if there's only one solution, that solution must be the trivial solution. Homogeneous systems don't really have theory that's unique to them, or to the extent that they do, it's rather trivial. Let's remind ourselves, when does a system of linear equations have infinitely many solutions? Well, to have infinitely many solutions, two conditions need to be satisfied. First, the system must be consistent. Second, the system must have at least one free variable. So this is a theorem for all systems. It has nothing to do with a system being homogeneous. What happens to this theorem? If you add in that the system is homogeneous, well, condition one is automatically satisfied. It is consistent. It has the trivial solution. So you're just left with condition two here. So if you're following along in the textbook, you'll see this stated as its own theorem, but it's really this old theorem from section 1.2 with the obvious modification. A homogeneous system has non-trivial solutions if and only if it has free variables. And it's kind of the curse of linear algebra that it's sort of sitting somewhere between pure and applied mathematics. So we'll learn a lot of theory like this. And then when we try to apply it, we find that maybe the theory isn't quite to the way to go. Because how do we decide whether a system has free variables? Well, we write the augmented matrix, we put it in reduced row echelon form. 
but that's also how you solve a system of linear equations. So by the time you know whether the system has free variables or not, you've already solved the thing, and there's not a lot of lifting left for this theory to do. Does anybody have questions about any of the definitions or theorems we've stated so far before we roll into an example? If not, let's look at the following system, 2x1, plus 5x2 minus 4x3 equals 0, negative 3x1 minus 2x2 plus 4x3 equals 0, 6 x1 plus x2 minus 8x3 equals 0. And that's, I won't say solve, but that's investigate to the solution to this homogeneous system. That's at least answer the question of whether it has infinitely many solutions or just the trivial solution. And we hopefully, you've done all the homework, so we hopefully remember the process. We're going to set up this augmented matrix. And we're going to use our calculator. We, aside from in the first test, I'll ask you to do gauss jordan elimination by hand. But other than that, we are pretty much done with doing this by hand. We'll go to our calculator. Let me see if this works. New share. Right, when I do a new share, it hides the screen for me, from me, but I anticipated that that might happen. So what I'm going to do is quickly jot this down so that when the calculator's up, I can read this off the white board. New share, get this calculator. Again, this always seems to take like three more steps than it seems like it should, but let's remind ourselves of the method. We go to the matrix menu, press the second button and then the inverse button. And we enter our uh, matrices into the calculator via edit. And I usually just, I mean, this matrix A is from last Thursday. We're done with it. We're not gonna use it again. I usually just overwrite these old matrices. So this is three, by four, and now I'll just two, five. Remember that this button down here is the negative button. If you type minus four, you're going to get an error message. Then negative three, negative two, four, zero and a six, one, negative eight, zero. 
And now that the matrix is in there, I don't think there's any way to just go back up the menu. I'm pretty sure that you have to quit entirely out. Go back in, go over to math. RREF, remember, reduced row echelon form. Back to the matrix menu. I see two of you working along. Is this what both of you got? Okay, so let me, before I go back to the whiteboard and this vanishes, let me quickly, well, actually I can just remember what this matrix is. Do not write on the whiteboard with the dry erase marker. Let's see, new share, whiteboard, share. We got this, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero. Zero, zero, one, zero. And let's apply our theorem, but then let's just give this a little thought. Remember that each column, except for the last column, corresponds to a variable. And this, and this, and this are our pivot position. The leading entry now that it's in row echelon form. Every variable has a leading entry in its column, meaning that every variable is basic. And there are no free variables. And if we go back to this theorem, having no free variables means that there is only the trivial solution. But going back to what I said earlier, citing this theorem is kind of an odd way to go about this problem, because now that we've done the elimination, this first row says x equal x1 equals zero. The second row says x2 equals zero. The third row says x3 equals zero. And this is the trivial solution. So we didn't really need a theorem to tell us there was only the trivial solution. We just solved the system of linear equations and the solution we got was the trivial solution. Still, this theorem is useful. It's sort of conceptually useful. It tells us that there will be non-trivial solutions if and only if there are free variables. And this will springboard us into our next topic, which is what do these infinite classes of solutions look like? first of all, and how do we write them down? I mean, there's an, if there's an infinite number of solutions, we obviously can't just list them all. So how can we describe such a solution set? I'm going to illustrate this via more or less via example, but let me state a theorem 
as well. If a homogeneous system has free variables. Let's give our free variables names. Let's call them U1, U2, up to UK. So if a homogeneous system has these free variables, then the solution set is going to be all of the linear combinations. The first free variable times some vector, thus the second free variable times some vector, and we just keep this pattern going until we run out of free variables. And the question then becomes, well, how do we find these vectors? How do we find V1, V2, up to Vk? And this I'm going to illustrate via example. It's kind of a hard process to describe, but I hope it will make sense when we see it. Let's look at the system 2x1 plus 3x2 minus x3 plus 5x4 equals 0. That will be our first um, equation. Then x1 minus x2 minus x3 plus 2x4 equals 0. That will be our um, second equation. So we have two equations four variables, and that's fine. I mean, we're used to having as many equations as we have variables, but it's not a problem that those numbers don't match. And I'm, let me see, here's our reg. Once again, when I share these, uh, share this screen so that it shows up on the recording. That's going to make the whiteboard disappear. So I'm going to quickly scroll this down so that I have access to it when I'm looking at the computer. We're going to solve this system. And we're going to solve this system the same way we solve any system, which is to go to our calculator, throw in the augmented matrix, and then put it in reduced row echelon form. So new share, get this calculator up. Again, our calculator does have the ability to store a whole bunch of different matrices. I normally just use A unless I'm saving it for something. So this augmented matrix has two rows, 
five columns. Let me just get this here as quickly as I can. Two, three, negative. Ah. So back to the matrix menu. Uh, back to name. So I. I always forget, I, I enter stuff in the calculator and I always get pair this and press the minus key on the keyboard, which then generates a negative sign and gives us a syntax error. So let's try that again. Negative one, five, zero, one, Negative one, negative one, two, zero. We double check that, that looks right. Out, back. Reduce throw echelon form. This is going to kick us out. Back again. And here is what we get when this matrix is put into reduced row echelon form. And so that I can copy this onto the whiteboard once the calculator vanishes, I'm going to draw this quickly on the white board. We, um, this, this is fine. We didn't get any ugly decimals here. Maybe I will just quickly show you if we do get a bunch of ugly decimals and we think maybe it would be nicer to work in fractions, we can press the math button, select fraction and convert the matrix to fractions, but these decimals don't offend me. We can just use them. Um, does everybody, I mean, I see a few people on their calculators. Did everybody get this? Does anybody have any questions before we go on? Gregory, sometimes do you have students zoom in also? Just not anyone today? Um, so previously this class, I mean, and this class is asynchronous. So students aren't expected to zoom in. I'm recording this lecture. So I, I mean, I do give online students the Zoom information. They can Zoom in if they want to. I don't think that they do want to. I have other resources for them online, but they could if they wanted to. Thank you. So let's see, new share, back to the whiteboard, and let's see, I know I'm standing right in your way, but if I try to stand here and write, my handwriting is going to the K, so let me just try to copy this Quickly. There's the first row. There's the second row. So this is in um, reduced row echelon form. We see that there are three variables. So our variables are x1, 
x2, x3, x4, and then the last column represents equality. Our pivot positions are there, meaning that x1 and x2 correspond to pivot columns, but x3 and x4 don't. Those variables are free. And what happens now if we write the equations that these rows correspond to? X1 minus 0 0.8 X3 plus 2.2 X4 equals zero, x2 plus 0 0.2 x3 plus 0 0.2 x4 equals zero. So in a sense, I guess, we've solved this system of linear equations. Every value of x1, x2, x3, and x4 that satisfies these conditions is a solution to our original system but it's kind of hard to, at least I think it's kind of hard to make sense of solutions that look like this. There's a very standard way of rewriting the systems to hopefully be clearer. And also, I mean, I stated this theorem that this is what a solution set should look like. That is not what this solution set looks like. So let's see if I can rewrite this so that it looks like this, so that it has the form of this theorem. So step one is going to be to get your free variables over to the right. At the moment, our free variables and our basic variables are mixed together. X1 and X2 are basic. X3 and X4 are free, and they're all mixed up. I'm going to take the free variable was over, and I'm going to do that just by using elementary algebra. We can add this to both sides. We can subtract the 2.2x4 from both sides and get. So I'm going to be switching back and forth here, but if we add the 0.8x3 and subtract the 2.2x4, there's an equation with the basic variable x1 on the left the free variable was over on the right. And here, x2 is basic, x3 and x4 are free. We can subtract 0.2x3 from both sides. 
we can subtract 0.2x4 from both sides. So x2 is negative 0.2x3 minus 0.2x4. And our goal here, once again, going back to this theorem, our goal is to get x equals x3 times some vector plus x4 times some vector. And if we want an equality that looks like this, we are missing variables because x is the, ve the vector x1, x2, x3, x4. And we have an x1 and we have an x2, but we're missing an x3 and we're missing an x4. So our second step is going to be to rectify this problem. And I call this a buffering step. This is just my terminology. It's not in the textbook or anything. But we have an equation for x1, and we have an equation for x2. And as is so often the case, I wish there were a quicker way to copy stuff over. Maybe there is, but 0.8, negative 2.2. There's our equation for x1. There's our equation for x2. And we want an equation for x3, and we want an equation for x4. But three variables are free, as their name implies. They're the linear algebra equivalent of independent variables from college algebra. So x3 and x4 can be anything. What equality could I possibly write here? Well, I'm going to write the rather trivial equality that every variable equals itself. I'm going to write that x3 equals one x3 plus zero x4, and x4 also equals itself. I'm going to write that x4 is zero x3 plus one x4. And now this is going to um, allow me to write what I wanted to write. These coefficients in front of the x3s are going to turn into a vector. These 
coefficients in front of x4 are going to turn into a vector. And I'm going to get that x equals x3 times this vector, 0.8, negative 0.2, 0, plus x4 times this vector. Notice that subtract the negative signs, like here we have subtraction, we um, subsume any subtraction into the vector. So instead of writing negative 2.2, it's plus negative 2.2. And this is the standard way of writing your solutions. And this is called the parametric form. And you'll have plenty of practice um, right solving these equations and writing their solutions in parametric form once you start on the homework. But does anybody know right now that they have questions on this material? Was anything about this process unclear? Anything I should talk about further? It's very easy for, um, for homogeneous systems of linear equations to have infinitely many solutions. Like in situations like this, where you have fewer variables than you have equations, that's almost always going to happen. It would be a freak if it didn't. I'm not even sure it's possible. But non-homogeneous systems can also have infinitely many solutions. And if we have a non-homogeneous system, this process, where we first do Gauss-Jordan elimination, then get the free variables to the right, then buffer in any missing equations. This process still basically works. It just needs to be modified a little. So let's see what happens. And after we've seen what happens, I'll, I'll write down a theorem, but let's look at 2x plus 2y plus 2z equals negative 2, 2x, plus 3y plus 2z equals 4x plus y plus z equals negative 1. And I mean, aside from the fact that I wrote this example on the board in this class period, there is nothing about this system that screams out, this is going to have infinitely many solutions. But if we just view this as a system that we're trying to solve, we'll perform Gauss-Jordan elimination and we'll see what happens. Okay. 
again, just give me a second. So the augmented matrix we're going to be working with is two, 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 negative two, two, three, two, four, one, 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 negative one. Graded all your homework. Nobody seemed to struggle with writing systems as augmented matrices, but if I do do anything that isn't clear to you, just give me a shout and we'll clarify it. Okay. I know that watching me type these matrices in isn't the most fascinating thing. So I'll just try to be efficient about this, hopefully without making any mistakes along the way. Let's see, those of you who have your calculators out have this in, then let's quit out. Math reduced row echelon form. Okay, here's what we get. And let me very quickly scroll this on the whiteboard for future reference. I mean, the, the physical whiteboard, not the Zoom whiteboard. And then we will go back to the Zoom whiteboard. And let's do this on another frame. And again, I know I'm directly in the way. I'm not doing anything interesting. Just copying the matrix that our calculator gave us. Okay, so here we here we are. Our columns represent variables, except for the last column, which represents equality. And our equations are x plus z equals negative seven y equals six, and then that last row gives us the distinctly uninteresting equation, zero equals zero. And if we get an equation, zero equals zero, that's not telling us anything useful. We're just going to delete that equation. We're going to ignore it. Um, but let's give this matrix a little more thought. Um, this was not the homogeneous system. It's perfectly possible there aren't any solutions at all. But in fact, that's not the case. This and this are our pivot positions. Neither of them are in the last column. It's a pivot position in the last column column that prevents solutions from existing. So solutions do exist. And after we circle our pivot positions, 
we notice that one of the variables doesn't have a pivot position in its corresponding column. That means that Z is free. And the fact that the last column is not a pivot column combined with this free variable means that infinitely many solutions exist. And we've got this X plus Z equals negative seven, Y equals six. And we're going to deal with this just the way we did with this last example. We're going to get our free variable z over to the right. X equals negative seven minus z. Y equals six. That's a perfectly fine thing to have. Um, y equals six, but we are now going to buffer these equations. And in addition to adding missing variables, in addition to adding z equals something, we're going to buffer in missing terms over here. Y equals six plus zero Z. And Z equals zero plus one Z. And now, these constants without any z's attached are going to give us a vector. These coefficients are going to give us another vector. X, Y, Z equals the constant vector negative seven, six, zero, plus the free variable Z times negative one, zero, one. So when you have non-homogeneous systems with infinitely many solutions, it looks basically like the homogeneous case, except you see we have this additional vector out there that isn't being multiplied by a free variable. Does all of the work I did to go from here to here makes sense to all of you. There's a theorem behind this, and it would be madness to try to use this theorem as a tool for solving non-homogeneous equations. You solve non-homogeneous equations with Gauss-Jordan elimination, just like we did this one. But the theorem is deceptively important. Even though when you put it on the board, it looks kind of like nothing. So let's write it. Say that we have a non homogeneous system with. Infinitely many 
solutions. What do those solutions look like? They look like a sum. Let's call a vector in the sum V sub P. And then let's call the next vector in the sum V sub H. And V sub P and V sub H both represent something. V sub P is a solution. So I've just said there are infinitely many solutions. One of those infinitely many solutions is going to be this V sub P. This is usually called a particular solution, which is where that P comes from. And this vector V sub H, is the solution to the homogeneous system you will get if you turn all the numbers on the right of the equality to zero. And this very cryptic theorem, if we go back a page, this might be um, Verified. So this negative seven six zero is a solution to that system of linear equations. So negative seven six zero is just a solution. This negative one zero one times Z this is the solution to the homogeneous system of linear equations. 2x plus 2y plus 2z equals 0. 2x plus 3y plus 2z equals 0. x plus y plus z equals zero. So as I say, this, uh, this theorem should not be thought of as a solution to, I mean, how could it be thought of as a solution to? In order to find the particular solution, you need to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. And once you've performed Gauss-Jordan elimination, you're basically done. The last thing you'd want to do is create a new system and then solve it. But this theorem has some important applications. We saw, well, some of you saw something very similar to this in a differential equation. 
things. The solution to linear non-homogeneous differential equations look like particular solutions plus the solutions to homogeneous differential equations. So linear algebra and differential equations, I mean, they're very different fields of mathematics, but there's something going on under the surface there that's causing the same theorem to appear in both those fields. And to we'll sort of talk about this with Mr. Vogel when you take our modern algebra course. The idea that we have these two objects that look very different, but actually have similar underlying structure. That is for the future, though, in fact, for an entirely different semester. Does anybody have any questions before I um, wrap? Before, well, actually, if nobody has any questions, this section is done. Does anybody have any questions before I start the next section? Sort of warned you about this at the beginning to have a linear algebra course in 16 weeks. We need to cover a little more than a section a day. I'm going to end this recording.